Right, so 1.1 is very introductory. It's more just like a general overview of kind of what we're getting into with all this. So there's not a ton of direct questions that actually show up on the test. There's a couple I'll point them out to you, but it's just kind of like the, the major theme that will kind of run throughout the course. So talk about scarcity. What scarcity is, is the fact that in any society there's a limited amount of resources that can be used towards production. There's also unlimited wants. So if we were to make a list of everything that everybody wants, it's going to be a pretty long list. And so there's obviously not enough resources to give everybody everything that they ever want. So in a society, we've got to decide, all right, what products are we going to make? Who's going to get these products? How many are we going to make? It's this whole allocation of these scarce resources. So, but it comes down to this concept of scarcity. Simple fact that we just don't have enough resources to give everyone what they want. So we've got to make choices within a society to figure out what good services to produce to satisfy these needs and wants of society. You know, hopefully everyone gets their needs met. Food, water, shelter, clothing, and so on and so forth. But for its needs, we got to figure out who gets it. This is really kind of where money comes into play and in the economy is that you know, the more money you have, then the more access you're going to have to resources. The less money you have, well, you're probably not going to have access to a lot of resources. And so Economies use money, or talk about free markets and capitalist economies. That's really what this whole course is about. Probably early on next week, maybe, maybe tomorrow. I can't remember exactly which section. We'll talk a little bit about socialism and communism, but we spend all of like 20 minutes on it the entire semester, which of course that's what everyone wants to talk about, but pretty much the entire micro course is free market and capitalism. But in a free market, that's really how we use money, how we associate money. With economics is we use it to regulate who gets access to these scarce resources. Gives you the textbook definition. Economics is a social science concerned with the efficient use of scarce resources to achieve maximum satisfaction of economic goals. And so we'll talk more about it today, but any kind of free market or capitalist society, people are going to do what benefits themselves the best, or what we call operating in their own self-interest. This isn't to say that they're selfish or that they don't care about others. It's just people are going to take care of their wants and needs with the means that they have. So this is actually really good for a free market because if everyone is buying and selling and trading and doing what is in their best interest, well, it creates a really healthy, fast-moving economy. If you remember back, um, it's kind of more of a macro concept, but um, a recession or a depression, such as the Great Depression, what that was was a really slow, sluggish time in the economy. There wasn't a lot of buying and selling and trading going on. And so you want this fast-paced, constantly moving company. That's really when it's at its healthiest state. And that happens when able, everyone's able to kind of take care of their own self-interest. Side note, textbook, I thought about it earlier. I really don't use a paper-based textbook anymore, mainly because trying to get students to actually open and read an economics textbook just doesn't happen, honestly. I've got them down here. If you just absolutely want one, I'm sure I can get you one. It's Krugman's AP Micro book, but I really got away from it a couple years ago because I found it useless, truth be told. But um, if I do anything from the textbook, there's an all online one that's not bad. Um, Who your classes ever use Open Stats? You ever heard of that? S T A X. Okay. Um, it was Rice University actually started it a couple years back, but it's a bunch of free online textbooks that are actually pretty good. The app's actually pretty user friendly as well. So if I were to use anything from a textbook, it would probably be that online open stacks books. But anyway, so that's just a, a tangent I thought of earlier that I don't actually use a textbook in here. Uh, a couple terms are just kind of introducing the fact that you're going to see words that are familiar throughout the course. Uh, we kind of use them in different ways in here though. They might mean slightly different things the way we apply them in economics. Examples are utility, marginal, capital, demand, investment. Marginal is probably the most important word throughout the entire course. You'll probably hear the word marginal a thousand times over the semester until the point that you're tired of it. But what we do more times than not is what we call marginal analysis, where really you're looking for changes. And we'll talk about it. Anytime you ever see the word marginal, typically you're going to add one and look for the change. We'll see that actually at the end of this lecture. We'll talk about a case of that. But um, 
And really marginal, if you've ever worked with derivatives, it's very similar, that you're just looking for the change. But um, just kind of be prepared that some stuff in this class will be vaguely familiar, but a lot of this you've never seen before. You'll kind of see that today in the first worksheet, that it's a different way of thinking, how you kind of have to analyze everything from a social perspective. So uh, with that, it takes a little bit of time to kind of wrap your head around it, but just kind of be prepared to, to think in a way that you're not really used to in here. Now, two major branches of economics. If you take any kind of business or you go into business in college, um, you may have to take both of these individually, or a lot of times you can take them as social science electives in college, even if you want to, but pretty much the difference is micro means small, macro means big. Obviously, you are in micro, that's what we're doing here, but micro is almost like a microscope into the economy that we're gonna look at individual people, individual businesses, um, individual markets, actually break down production costs for businesses, such as how many people should they hire, um, how many products should they produce, what price should they charge, looking at things such as profit, how much money do they make, look at labor markets, which is the supply and demand for labor. And so really it's more of looking at these very specific segments within an entire economy. Macro is a very large scale view that looks at unemployment, inflation, um, international trade, now you're looking at the entire economy as a whole. And so um, they offer, and they offer AP Micro as well. I don't know way back when why we decided Micro over Micro. We just did, someone did, but um, there's also an AP Micro course up there. But, um, but Micro is kind of more graphs in a way. It's a little bit more math intensive, not hard math, but um, it's more graphing, analyzing, math, whereas macro is a little bit more theory, uh, the kind of big picture I did stuff. So there's a little bit different application. So what we're doing here is actually very different from what economists do in the real world. Uh, this is mostly a theory and concept course that we kind of look at now, what are the underlying ideas and concepts behind economics, kind of to theorize how markets work? In the real world, economists take these big sets of data, um, all these numbers and information, and they use them to make predictions about what they think the economy is going to do. That you've ever heard on the news, they might say, you know, economists think that unemployment's going to go up next year, or you know, economists think that the housing interest rate is going to go down next year. Now, that's economists taking this information they have and using it to make predictions about what they think the economy is going to do. Um, policy economics is when the government takes what these economists say and uses it to write policies to either promote or avoid what they think is going to happen. You know, economists say, all right, we think that unemployment is going to rise next year. Well, then the government say, all right, economists think unemployment is going to go up. What can we do to combat that? You know, what kind of policies can we put in place to keep unemployment lower? And so that's what we're policy economics, which really is more of a macro concept. Um, you talk more about policy in there. Yeah, actually, we don't talk about policy at all in here. So uh, just kind of introduces how it works in the real world. Two types of statements, positive and normative. At most, you're going to see one or two questions on the AP test. And typically, it is, you know, of these five statements, which one is positive? Or of these five statements, which one is normative? But the difference is positive, they are fact-based, they can be proven, uh, things that are absolutely true. Normative are more opinionated sounding, or what ought to be, what should be, uh, you know, more judgmental statements. So to kind of give you some examples, You can see the first one says the rising price of crude oil on world markets will lead to an increase in gas prices. Well, yes, that's absolutely true. If so crude oil gets more expensive, then yes, gas prices are going to go up. We can absolutely say that. If you go to number three, though, it says pollution is the most serious economic problem. Well, says who? You know, that may be what one economist says, but it's hard to absolutely prove that without any additional information. So that'd be more of a normative statement. That is more opinionated. But, Big thing is, just know the difference, and you'll be fine. Like I said, 
usually one question per year on the difference. Right, economic assumptions. You don't have to memorize these. It's just kind of an overview of some of the, the big picture ideas that we're going to hit. But uh, we're already talking about number one. Society has unlimited wants, unlimited resources. That's that concept of scarcity that not everyone can get what they want. Second one, due to scarcity, choices must be made. Every choice has a cost, or what we call a trade-off. And so a little bit later on, we're going to define this a little bit more as what we call opportunity cost. But the way it works is that every time you make a choice, there's certain things that you gave up by not making that choice. You know, if you chose to sleep in an extra 30 minutes this morning, well, maybe you gave up going to Starbucks, or you gave up hanging out with friends before class. And so every single choice that you make has a trade-off. Well, we're actually going to put a, a quantitative measure on it later called Opportunity Cost. We'll measure how much you actually gave up. But it's kind of getting into the economic mindset that you know every time you do something, there's also something you had to give up. Not necessarily money, but you know some kind of trade-off that you gave up by making a decision. Number three, everyone's goal is to make choices that maximize their satisfaction. Everyone acts in their own self-interest. That's what we were talking about a minute ago. That you know, it doesn't mean everyone's selfish, it just means people are going to do what benefits them the most. Um, and it's actually really good for the economy. Or everyone makes decisions by comparing the marginal costs and marginal benefits of every choice. So number four is probably the most important uh, when we get down to what this class is really about. So anytime you ever see the word marginal, pretty much you're going to add one and look for the change. Um, and I'll probably make a note of that. You're going to see marginal a lot, but anytime you see that word marginal, send up a red flag that, hey, I'm, I'm adding something and I'm looking for the change that's occurring. And so if we're comparing cost and benefits, cost is something you give up, benefit is something you gain. And this is an, really this is an internal decision that you make thousands of times per day. Internally, you just don't sit down and graph it out like we're going to do it here. But human nature pretty much says that as long as the benefit is greater than the cost, you're going to keep doing something. At any point that the cost becomes greater than the benefit, it's not worth it anymore and you're going to stop. And so we're going to see that kind of progression time and time again in this class. That something's going to continue up until the point that the cost becomes greater than the benefit. Now we're going to call this a bunch of different things along the way, but that same concept is going to repeat over and over again. That as long as the benefit is greater than the cost, you're going to keep doing it. Then number five, real life situations can be explained and analyzed through simplified models and graphs. We do a lot of graphing here. Um, unit 1 doesn't have much, uh, really. There's only one major graph in Unit 1. But once we get to 2 and through the rest of units, it's a good bit of graphing. It's a lot of analyzing. Uh, it's not difficult math, but you know, it's a lot of models and graphing and analyzing. That's really what this course comes down to. A couple terms um, that we'll see a lot. Utility is just the satisfaction or the benefit that you get from something. Um, a lot of times when we get to utility more in depth, I teach it as the happiness that you get out of something. Um, uh, utility is satisfaction, happiness, benefit. What do you get out of it? Marginal, we've already said. Add one, look for the change. And then allocate just means to distribute. Just allocate is to spread the love, share the wealth. How are we going to allocate these scarce resources throughout society? Right. Price and cost. Um, you'll inherently get these on your own as we go throughout the semester. But um, in a general sense, price is associated with what we call the consumer. And that's really what you're more familiar with. So when you go to Walmart and you buy something, you're acting as a consumer. You have demand for a product. And so you're going to pay a price for that product. If you were to produce something or make something or sell something, then you're going to have a cost of production. And so price is associated with the consumer. Cost is associated with the producer. We'll get to production cost in Unit 3, and you'll be working with that a lot. And so I wouldn't worry about it too much right now because it'll, it'll work itself out on its own in those two different terms. Investment, 
You don't see that a ton in this class, but any time that it does come up, investment just means it's money spent by the business to improve their production. Now, a lot of times we think of investment as people putting money from outside the business into the business. But the way we kind of look at it here is that investment is when the business pretty much spends money on itself to improve its production in some manner. Consumer goods and capital goods. Uh, a good is something that's produced. So any kind of product is a good, whether it's a shoe or a backpack or a water bottle or a smart board or whatever. That's a good. It's a product that's been produced. Consumer goods and capital goods kind of split on whether the good can be used to produce something else or whether the good just ends with the consumer and has no future use. And so more times than not, I'm going to explain economics using the production of pizza because it actually works out really well. And so a pizza is a consumer good, meaning it has no future use. That You, know, you can't use a pizza to produce anything else. Whereas a pizza oven is a capital good because it's used to produce future goods. So consumer goods pretty much end with the consumer. They have no future use. They cannot produce anything else. Capital goods do produce other goods. And so we're going to talk about growth uh, later on with this. And this really comes back into play when we get to the first graph um, here in a couple of units. We'll get to it sometime next week. But just in a general sense, consumer goods don't produce other goods. Capital goods do. Uh, four factors of production. And this is actually talking about you know, what does it take to produce a product or a good. And so we've got really four big ideas. Land, labor, capital, and the fourth one we'll see in a second is entrepreneurship. So land refers to what are the natural resources? What are the most basic elements that we can pull from the earth to produce this product? So, you know, of course, if we're producing a pizza, you know, dough and cheese and sauce, but it goes a little bit further than that. You know, we're going to need wheat to produce the dough. We're going to need a cow to produce the cheese. We're going to need a tomato to produce the sauce. We're going to need some solar energy to grow the plants. We're going to need some water. Um, you know, what are the most basic elements we need to produce this product? That's the land as far as the factor of production. Labor is just who are the people that are producing this product. So yeah, we need someone that can make a pizza. But we also need a farmer that can grow wheat. You know, we need someone that can raise cattle. We need someone that can deliver these goods to the processing plant. We need someone that can get it to the restaurant. You know, someone that can make the pizza, someone that can deliver the pizza. And so labor is talking about every person involved in the production process. But labor is just the people involved. Capital, you've got two different types, physical and human. Physical capital refers to the machinery and the tools needed to produce a product. And so, you know, physical capital would be that pizza oven. You know, hence when we call them capital goods. But, you know, physical capital is, you know, we need a pizza oven. You know, we need the pizza pans, bag it on. We need the rolly cutter thing to slice it. You know, what are the actual machinery and tools needed to produce this product? Human capital refers to the knowledge and the skill sets needed. And so, yes, someone has to know how to assemble a pizza, someone's got to know how to bake it, but someone's also got to know how to grow wheat, someone's got to you know, know how to raise cows, someone's got to be able to drive a truck um, to deliver these things. And so, you know, what are the, the knowledge and the skill sets needed to produce this? And a lot of times when you talk about investment, businesses will invest in human capital. That, you know, if a business sends an employee to training or they send them back to college to get a new degree or, you know, an MBA or whatever, you know, they're investing in the human capital of that company. Um, honestly, now you're seeing companies such as Amazon and places like that that will actually send you back to school to get a degree knowing that you're going to leave the company because it invests pretty much in the human capital of society. That, you know, everyone gain knowledge, then that's a good societal indicator, and so that's what they're going for. So, you know, it's still an investment in this human capital. But anyways, knowledge, skill sets. All right, fourth final one, entrepreneurship. So anytime there's a new idea, someone has to have that idea. They've also got to have the initiative to get it going and make it a reality. And so this is your entrepreneur. Um, it was Henry Ford, Bill Gates, um, Steve Jobs was a good one. Right now, Elon Musk. Um, is a great example of an entrepreneur. Yes, he's kind of got his quirks, but 
you know, Tesla, SpaceX, you know, he's got kind of these innovative ideas, but he's actually put them into production and made a reality of them. Now, anytime that you do this, you inherently take on a greater risk too. But the bigger the risk, then the bigger the chance for the payout, or what we call profit. Profit's how much money the business gets to keep. And it gives you a little formula down there. Don't worry about the formula right now. That's really unit three stuff we'll, we'll get to plenty when we get there. But you know, someone's got to have the idea. Someone's got to put it into motion. Someone's got to take on that risk. But if it pays out, that typically it works out really well for them. But there's a lot of times these people fall on their face too. That's that risk. This is actually something you can major in in college. Um, you can get a degree in entrepreneurship, whether it is helping startup companies, whether it is trying to start your own companies. Um, but there's actually a, a degree in entrepreneurship. Uh, productivity. Um, once again, this kind of tiptoes on some unit three stuff, but it just goes ahead and introduces it. But, Basically, this is common sense. If Bob can make 10 pizzas in one hour and Stan can make five pizzas in one hour, Bob is more productive. He can produce a greater output with a smaller amount of resources. In this case, time being the resource. And so that's all it's referring to. That if Bob can produce more pizzas, Bob's more productive. We all understand that. And so we'll talk much more about productivity later on. And that's unit 1.1 for you. Questions? Does it make sense? We kind of get the idea. 